When is a house not a house? He operates on the edge of the law. When it's a boat the size of a house? It's a monstrosity, basically. Lots of this woman's neighbours have cats, but only one's got a three-storey catamaran. It's had more of an impact than the earthquakes. His mother called me a dirty, horrible, low-grade... Welcome to Avonside, right on the side of the Avon River, Christchurch. If you're after a touch of Old England and even a dash of Cambridge, you could do worse than Avonside. The river is as pretty as a picture and shallow enough you don't have to worry about falling in. Not far from the river, we caught up with friends Anne-Marie and Susan. Hello, nice to see you. <laughs> along with another of Susan's friends. She's called Wahini, and she was dressed as a Wahini, a Polynesian maiden. She's my security doll, so that burglars will think someone is in the house. Only one of these three is not having trouble with their neighbour. Can you guess which one? Over 11 years, we've had disruptions from next door. Dreadful industrial building and smells and noises, and you just can't enjoy relaxing. Wahine is the only one currently enjoying any relaxation on this couch. That's because Susan and Anne-Marie have both been... ..badly disrupted and disturbed. ..by the neighbour. And unfortunately, this problem is as big as a house. Except that it's a boat. Well, it's a three-storey houseboat. It's on two hulls and it's a huge building. Susan's next-door neighbour has built a modern-day Noah's Ark in his backyard. But unlike Noah's, this ark might not be seaworthy, according to Anne-Marie. I'm not a boaty, but I have the impression that if you put that in the water, it would be top-heavy, turn turtle and sink. Is it a boat or is it a house? Or a boathouse? Or a houseboat? <laughs> or a house? Whatever it is, it's a massive eyesore, according to Anne-Marie and Susan. And that's a massive problem because they can't see it making its maiden voyage anytime soon. I can't see that it would be seaworthy. I fail to see it being a boat. And I also wonder how they could remove that boat from the backyard. This labour of love has taken years to construct and it's been all hands on deck. Just over the garden fence. There were all these people, massive noise, smells of fibreglassing and glues and other things. And we were intimidated often by youths looking over the fence at us so that I'd often not go in the spa pool, for example, because they'd shriek out horrible things and so on. We want to be relaxing and enjoying life, but it's like a terrible machine going on all the time. Like most machines, the neighbour's house-shaped boat has been making a lot of noise. In 2009, we had five weeks of incredible noise. <gasps> it was so bad, it was driving me crazy, that I decided to record it. Using a rudimentary analogue recording device, Susan was able to capture the full horror of the cacophony next door. And I'll play it for you, if you like. Yes, please. As you can see, it's quite loud. That's soaring. <laughs> Hours of infuriating noise, and I could do nothing about it. If there was nothing Susan could do about the machine noise, there was even less she could do about the neighbour's taste in local radio. The radio was often very loud, and it was often commercial. I think builders quite often like loud radio. And I don't like commercial radio. It used to make me so upset. Commercial radio can be offensive to more refined tastes. So Susan made sure to keep her doors and windows closed. But still, the neighbour managed to bring the noise. As well as the noise from the building, he had two Alsatians, and they were barking a lot. And they were disturbing because if you'd turn a light on at night, they'd start barking. As soon as you opened the back door and went on the deck, they'd be barking. He also had a parrot which screeched. It started at 6.30 every morning. 
A parrot was sort of like a watchbird. Was it a parrot? I think it was a sulphur-crested cockatoo. The sulphur-crested cockatoo is regarded as a pest in parts of its native Australia. It is renowned for its intelligence and raucous call. Parrots can be used for security, but the parrot hasn't been around for some time. I think it died. <laughs> to best my knowledge, he doesn't have a peg leg, so... I don't think he's a pirate. Susan tried repeatedly to engage her neighbour, but permission to come aboard was never granted. I've put quite a few letters into his letterbox because there's an iron fence and you can't get in the gates. Impossible to communicate with him. Sick of being kept in the dark, Susan did something that would make John Key proud. She began surveillance. Well, I did spy on him because I was so upset by what he was doing and I wanted to know what was happening next door because we were involved with all the noise, the smells and so on. Sadly, Susan gained little insight from her spying, but using her camera did give her an insight into her neighbour's mother. His mother also, once when I was trying to take a photo, came out and called me a dirty, horrible, low-grade... Over the back of Susan's, we found Dave, who lives directly off the stern of his neighbour's vessel. That's just off the port quarter in Boating Parlance. Well, I've been living here for 14 years now, uh, since January 99. And it's been fine. And then all of a sudden, this uh, arc has sort of reared its ugly head. One reason Dave calls this an arc is because the only way he can see it moving is through a weather event of biblical proportions. I don't know how he's going to get it out, but I think he must know something. Flood, I think, would be the only way to get that out. When I start seeing animals coming down the road in twos, I'll take a hint, then I'll go then. Dave actually had an agreement with the neighbour allowing him to do some work on the boat at agreed times, but he had no idea what he was signing up for. I didn't expect to come back and see that, otherwise I definitely wouldn't have given him permission. I thought he was just going to finish off the base and then move it to a hoka like he did last time, but then when I come back, all oh, that's up. Dave wasn't expecting a ship on his doorstep, nor was he expecting the solar eclipse it's now causing. We, we, we used to get some nice lot, lot of sun. We don't get any sun now until it's up there. You know, it blocked out the sun. It's a monstrosity, basically. Who wants to see that? I'll take the rubbish out, and it's in my eyes all the time, I'll take the rubbish out. I'll go down a pub. I've got to pass it from the front. It's just... Well, mind-boggling. You may be wondering if this epic structure is even legal in a residential zone. We were wondering the same thing. So was Dave and Anne-Marie and Susan and possibly Wahine. So Dave went to the council. The council said that he's breaching no regulations because it is not a dwelling. It's a temporary structure. I think the council are, are, are wrong. It's all wrong. Council regulations state a temporary structure is permissible as long as it's for personal use and not the product of commercial activity. But Dave and Anne-Marie and Susan and possibly Wahine have some thoughts on that. He is, in theory, operating within the law because he is building a boat for his own purposes. That permits him to build an ocean-going liner in the backyard. But it's the ocean liner scale of this boat that has everyone thinking this is not really a pet project. This is a commercial boatyard. He states it as a commercial boatyard on his website. That is a very large backyard, which you could very easily build at least one large single-storey house on. Is almost entirely occupied by sheds of various levels of decrepitude and now dominated by a three-storey boat, 100 feet long. The sheer scale of the operation is well and truly beyond building a pleasure boat in the backyard. I would be terrified if something caught fire around here because I think there is an enormous fire hazard sitting in this community and it's right next door. We approached the Christchurch City Council for an explanation about how this could be allowed to happen. The council told us that despite being a boat, 
the neighbour's pride and joy does fit the definition of a building. The council said, this boat as a structure under the city plan meets the required standards. The council also said, there is no rule in the district plan under the Resource Management Act that limits hobbyists building a boat in residential zones. The council concluded, the boat can remain in this location so long as it complies with the district plan rules. I think the council are, are, are wrong. They should have gone into it more deeply, especially with the amount of um, complaints they've had. The council may be ready to accept that this is a boat, but Anne-Marie has given up thinking of her neighbour's creation as a seagoing vessel. I don't understand how one could come to any conclusion other than that. He's building a house. I mean, looking at it now, I don't see how it can be a houseboat um, because of the, the, the materials it's used for the, you know, the superstructure. Oh, it's, if you see, it's all cheap ply. I mean, it doesn't look like it's marine ply, so how it's going to stand up to um, the elements. At the moment, this ambiguous plywood wonder can't stand up to scrutiny, let alone the elements. I'm at a loss to understand what, what's in the guy's mind to build it something like that here. Neighbours at War approached the neighbour with a long list of questions we were desperate for him to answer. He very politely declined to appear on this programme, which just rubs sea salt into Susan's wound. Well, the quality of the last 11 years has been mired by the neighbour next door ruining a peaceful and beautiful environment for me. It's had more of an impact than the earthquakes for me. He operates on the edge of the law. He couldn't give a toss about the impact that he has upon other people. A lot of people have moved out because of, because of him. I might try one of these days. Since filming, Susan reports that the thing next door is now closer to a house than a boat because people appear to be living in it. And unfortunately, it's no closer to the sea. Welcome to Frankton, just out of Hamilton Central in the heart of the Waikato. Frankton is the only township in New Zealand that willingly describes itself as quirky. And round here, they believe that's why you'll like it. Local quirks include open polls night at the local pub. Yes, that does mean what you think it means. At the end of a cul-de-sac, we caught up with BMX enthusiast Nick, who lives in this charming three-bedroom unit with his flatmate and young daughter. Frankton can have its like quiet moments, but it can have its moments where, you know, quite a bit, bit can happen. I've seen a bit of action over the time since I've been here. Nick's seen a bit of action lately, thanks to the neighbour. He came round about 2.30 in the morning, came round to my sliding door and just banged the absolute crap out of my door. I watched the movie and I'd fallen asleep on the couch and he started yelling at me. He was like, turn your f***ing music down. I'm sick of hearing all your loud music and all, all this. Just, and really just trying to rip, rip me apart with um, just, just noise levels. Must have been a hell of a movie. The movie I was watching was Saw 6. The Jigsaw Puzzles, uh, the Jigsaw Killer. Sorry? You've not seen the series? Oh, sadistic violence sort of thing. He sets up all these different like contraptions for way to people they have to like do these painful things to prove they're worthy to keep their life. Otherwise, the contraption or whatever they're in will kill them. Hmm, that does sound quite distressing. We approached Nick's neighbour to learn more about his concerns. Unfortunately, he preferred not to talk, but he has been talking to the council. His complaints have resulted in Nick becoming the most complained about neighbour in the Hamilton area. Over the whole year, I've had at least a good 30 noise control warnings. It's almost like he set out his own personal vendetta towards me. Nick maintains, aside from the usual household noise, he's done nothing to provoke his neighbour. I did actually throw an egg at his house, but that's the only thing I've ever done. Correction, hurling a few eggs across the fence is the only thing Nick has done to provoke his neighbour. Oh, actually, that's not the only thing I've done, actually. Uh, I've, yeah, I've thrown, thrown an egg at the place. I've sat up on the fence, um, purposely shining a laser through his window uh, for a good 20 minutes. Clearly, Nick's not sitting on the fence on this. That's why he's been sitting on the fence. 
but they kept ignoring me, so I'd sit up on the fence and just try and make them notice me. But any attempts that I'd made, they just blatantly ignored. After all the noise control complaints and all the money it's cost me, it's extremely frustrating that they can't, you know, even just come out and talk. Perving, laser lights and eggs over the fence. Nick's attempts to engage the neighbour may be unorthodox, but they did succeed in drawing a response, namely a sprinkler in the face. Once the sprinkler um, came inside, I, I raced outside and put my head over the fence and he started getting me about noise levels and how he's had problems with it in the past. and. And also, and then he said, that's when he also friended me saying, what well, I've made the last three tenants move was to say I can't uh, make you move. But sodden carpet is the least of Nick's worries. The neighbours' complaints and the resulting fines are starting to impact on Nick's family situation. My laptop's been taken off me twice. Both times it's cost me $200 to get it back from the council. And just recently I got a $750 fine for infringing the abatement notice. What really annoyed me is like, you know, noise control, they could have taken my speakers that I have set up off my laptop, but they actually took my laptop, so, and that's my only, you know, way to access the internet, organise my caregiving and trying to organise, you know, the week and, and even my daughter being in daycare. But Nick's not the only one making a lot of noise about this. The neighbour has launched his own sonic salvos. He'd set up his road bike pretty much right outside the fence. Um, with the exhaust pointing through towards the lounge here and rev the absolute crap out of it and then finishes that and then gets a massive petrol generator out, sticks that pretty much in the same spot and sets up the sprinkler, which ended up going straight in my door and in my lounge by a good metre. Unfortunately, this looks like a dispute in which there's a lot of noise being made, but nobody's actually hearing anyone else. There's no legitimate reason whatsoever for having the bike next to the fence with the exhaust pointing through the fence towards my lounge and revving the absolute crap out of it. It was pretty loud. I couldn't, we couldn't hear anything inside this house. Now, all Nick wants is to hear words instead of noise. What I'd like to happen is just be, be able to have like the mutual talking ground. Just talk to me, mate. Just talk to me. Since filming, Nick's neighbour has relocated and despite Nick's reputation, there's been no problems with the new neighbour.